it's a great pleasure today uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Schatz. Known to many of us here, many of you who are new, I think it's fun to just uh, go over a bit of his background. So Dr. Schatz, in fact, is a native Californian, uh, born in Glendale, which happens to be the same place my husband was born. The, uh, but he, and he quickly spent, uh, I think, developed a few California traits, like not living in the snow very much. Um, he got his uh, undergraduate degree at UCLA in bacteriology and then went on to Chicago, which is I think the last time he lived in the snow, um, where he got his MD at Loyola. He then did his residency in Hawaii, followed up by his trauma and critical care fellowship in Miami, a major trauma uh, center there where he spent the bulk of his career before being recruited to UC Davis. He had lots of leadership positions in terms of uh, working with uh, first responders, organizing trauma systems, really uh, made a tremendous contribution to organizing the trauma system uh, in Miami, which is another big trauma center. He was recruited to UC Davis in 2004, where he also uh, has continued to be involved in these activities, organizing our uh, county medical systems and our EMS systems and participating as a medical director in those activities uh, here. I don't know where he developed his love of skiing, but anybody who knows Dr. Schatz also knows that although he doesn't like to live in the snow, he spends a lot of time um, as much as he can skiing and being involved in the uh, ski patrol activities and organizing trauma activities there. Not a surprise at all to me when early on in the COVID uh, crisis and particularly when Sacramento was not seeing as much activity, but New York was quite busy, Dr. Schatz um, asked if he could go volunteer and help out um, in the, the, the uh, I would say, ground zero, if you will, of the, uh, the COVID activity in uh, New York. And I think I didn't appreciate that the timing was going to be so um, important. But as we are starting to see a resurgence here, I think we are really looking forward to hearing about your experiences and lessons learned there. So Dr. Schatz, it's with great pleasure to uh, introduce you to our, our first of the year grand rounds. Dr. Farmer, thank you. Um, and thanks for those of you who are here. It's easier to talk to people than it is to talk to air. So uh, uh, thanks for being here. And um, someday we're actually gonna take these masks off and the interns are gonna see what we actually look like. Um, so anyway, um, to, to uh, go on with what Dr. Farmer said, um, I'm not sure exactly how uh, the whole thing happened, but uh, I got an email from Dr. Farmer one day with Dr. Cooperman, the chief of uh, emergency medicine, um, and somehow through the California Medical Association and somehow through the New York uh, City Hospital System. So somehow uh, that email got to me and uh, thought about it for a couple of days, spoke to my wife who immediately said, that's what you do, you need to go. Uh, I've been doing search and rescue for a long time, so that military experience and all, I guess she's used to me leaving um, shortly. And with Dr. Farmer's blessing and my wife's blessing, uh, I found myself in New York. Um, one of the reasons, well, actually I had two reasons to go. One, uh, you know, I'm an intensivist and that's what we do, and that's what they needed in New York. So I figured uh, we could probably help out. I figured those people at this point had been, the, the employees that had been so uh, inundated for so long, um, that they could use some time off, and you know, that was an understatement. Um, the other part of it was just to learn. Uh, you know, we were, we've been extremely fortunate in California, and certainly in Sacramento, that the number of cases we've seen here have been minimal um, compared to in New York, for sure, and even compared to Los Angeles. But, um, you know, the patients that we get here are, we you know, have like 22, I think, a couple days ago, and four were in the ICU. Um, it's the pulmonary critical guys take care of those patients. They, they have never been overwhelmed to the point that it starts flowing into where the, the surgical intensives get involved. Um, so we just don't have the, the volume and we haven't had the, um, the acuity, I think, of what, uh, what we end up seeing in New York. So it's a, it a world of difference in New York. Um, and as I said a few times, it was kind of like the Wild West when we got there. So that was my reason for going, um, and I can say that um, I think I helped, but I certainly uh, learned a heck of a lot. Um, see, I'll see the, that little white dot with the uh, red things coming off on the KCRA. This is what it really looks like. So, um, so I want to read this to you. Um, Nick is 41 years old. 
no pre-existing health conditions, don't know how he got COVID-19, but he did. Ended up in the ER on the 30th of March and intubated a day later. Since then, he's had um, uh, infections, heart has, heart has stopped, he's had two strokes, he's on ECMO, been on dialysis, had a fasciotomy because of the ECMO catheter thrombosed his artery, um, amputated his right leg, he's had multiple bronchoscopies, septic shock, fungus in his lungs, tracheostomy, blood clots, and a pacemaker. 38 days now in the ICU, this disease does not only affect old people, this is real. Unfortunately, it became really real two days ago. This uh, email was written by the wife of Nick Cordero, the famous uh, broad, uh, Broadway actor who died on Sunday after 95 days in the ICU. Um, so this is real. This is, uh, we don't see it much here, but it is the real thing. So what do we know about it so far? Obviously, uh, it, the, the research and the papers are just abounding in the literature. Uh, some are simply one page uh, uh, papers and some are, are a bit longer. But uh, what we know so far, this is only the seventh of the coronaviruses known to infect humans. Uh, four of them are basically never heard about because they don't cause much in the way of symptoms. We now, the, the three you see up there, the original uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome um, coronavirus, SARS-1. Um, it was the original, the Middle East re uh, respiratory syndrome, the MERS, it came out uh, a little bit later, we'll talk about that. And then of course the virus we're talking about now, the SARS-CoV-2. Um, they're all member of the, the beta coronavirus family. The uh, um, conspiracy theorists, I think, that some government created this virus are, are wrong based on the fact that 93% of the spike protein we'll talk about uh, is the same as the bat coronavirus. So that's why we think that the, the, uh, this disease is coming via bats. Um, they get into the food that we eat, and that food oftentimes is that what's sold in the, in, in the case of China in the markets, and we end up eating that food and then off and running. Um, the first one, the first SARS came out, came via dogs and cats of a variety of, of species, I guess, um, in the markets in China, and then uh, camels actually for in the uh, Middle East uh, virus. So the, the key to this, the virus entering the host cell is a spike protein. And that's what you see in those, that little red, white dot with those little red things sticking out. Those are spike proteins. Um, they form as trimers, and that's they call they form like a little um, um, crown, and hence the word coronavirus. Um, it's a big uh, transmembrane uh, glycoprotein. There's some work out at UC San Diego in the last few weeks that suggests that the glycan part of the molecule is actually somewhat protective for the virus, kind of coats it. Um, but it, it, it forms in those trimers. There are the N terminus and the C terminal ends. The N terminal end is required for, 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 uh, for um, receptor uh, connection binding. So the key uh, to that virus getting into our cells is the um, ACE2 receptor. Without that, the cell, that virus can't get into the cell. So it binds with that ACE2 receptor, and then it, uh, it fuses with this, this uh, protease called TMP or SS2. Um, when it cleaves that, it now uh, fuses with the virus or with the host cell, and the virus enters our host cell. Um, interesting enough, I mean, Japan created a drug in the 80s called this camostat mesylate. We used to treat uh, the, uh, the uh, symptoms of chronic pancreatitis and esophagitis or esophageal reflux. Um, been around for like, you know, since the 80s, but this drug is actually a protease inhibitor that seems to have some effect on this PTMPSRSS2. ss 2 uh, so there's actually a study going on starting in April in Denmark to look at this as a possible treatment for the uh, coronavirus. <clears throat> so this is what do we know uh, for our cell-wise. So the A is the um, uh, normal cells, B are the infected cells, and down there at the bottom are the virions inside the cell, uh, and that's the uh, genome that we now know about this virus. 2003 is when this original SARS came out. Um, it had it, about 8,000 people got infected, and about 770 died, so it's a little bit less than 10%. But with normal um, kind of vector control, they uh, isolating people properly, the patients properly, and with travel restrictions, the virus disappeared. So in about two years, it was gone. The MERS virus um, has a much higher mortality, but it doesn't, um, doesn't it, it's not very uh, infectious, I guess. Um, it's still around. It pops up occasionally in the Middle East, um, but it just disappears for a while and then shows up again. So it has got a higher mortality, but it's not very, around very much. And we know about this, our, the current SARS virus, um, the, the mortality changes almost daily. 
um, as we get more information, as we do more testing, as we get uh, ex expand the, the testing to younger people, for instance, and asymptomatic patients, that mortality is going to change constantly until we get a better feel for it. And in virology, the, the key is how, I guess, infectious or how contagious the virus is. And that's known as a reproduction number. Um, there are various terms, and you'll see this is RO out of the viro virology world, out of the public health world, is R effective. Um, so this little uh, chart just shows how effective, how infective uh, this virus is. So this number is how many people a single person will infect. So in the case of, um, of the uh, coronavirus, it's about 1.4, so a single person will infect 1.4 people. So you can see that actually influenza is actually higher than that. Uh, we know that the vi in, come uh, influenza season, the hospitals are overloaded with uh, flu patients. We know that tens of thousands of people die every year. We just don't get overly excited about it, or it'll hear on the news at least, because it's a virus that's been around forever, um, and we all have some degree of immunity, and we have a, a vaccine for it. We don't have any of that for the uh, coronavirus, so um, that's hence it's, it's big um, um, push out in the literature or out in the, on the news. So this is a website that um, came out about a week and a half ago, released to the public about a week and a half ago, uh, still in its, in its uh, beta testing. Um, and as you can see, there's, there's the now cast, which means like what's happening right now. Um, then there's the forecast, and they put in scenarios. This is the kind of data that Governor, Governor Newsom uses to, make, to uh, basically make the plans for what the state should be doing. So this R effective, if the R effective is one, uh, the virus will just kind of be contained. If it's less than one, we're actually getting ahead of the virus. If it's uh, more than one, the virus is going to keep uh, uh, spreading. So as you can see, this is California data. Um, if we can keep the vi uh, keep that R effective at one, uh, we will stay in September about the same two, two and a half percent of population infected. If it goes up to 1.5, for instance, almost 25 percent of the population will be, if California will be infected come September. This is as of yesterday morning, uh, Los Angeles at 0.96. Uh, actually, as of this morning, it dropped it to 0.9. Uh, Sacramento State at 1.15, so we're a little bit above, and the, like the likelihood of the virus is still spreading is likely. Um, Marin, this is, I put in Marin because this is where they were last Thursday, uh, but just to show you that these numbers of 1.5 are real. So 1.4 is what they're at last week. This week, they're way down, and you can see on this caterpillar graph here, um, Marin is now way down here. Um, Sacramento last week was about number three, and now we're down to about number six. So it changes frequently, um, uh, pretty aggressively, actually. So this is a different website. Um, again, back in, back in March, we were at a pretty high level. As we got better control by the end of March, we're now actually down to green and below that 1.0. So now uh, we're back up. Here's our reopening, and now we're back up into... In fact, it's level spreading, um, not as high as it was, but still in spreading. So we've done a good job here. Um, we've seen a low number of cases. We've seen a low number of mortalities compared, comparatively. So how did New York get hit so bad? One of the reasons is um, the uh, uh, population density. So that's the number of people per square mile. So in California, even though we have places like L.A. and San Diego and even Sacramento, uh, population density in California in general is 251 people per square mile because we have a lot of desert and mountains and stuff where people don't live. Alaska, you can have your own square mile. Um, <laughs> Sacramento, we're about 5,000 people per square mile. Kind of, I mean, you think about a square mile, and there's 5,000 people um, in that square mile. That seems like quite a bit. Um, but San Francisco is 18,000. So... LA, with 4 million people, is only 8,000 because they have 10 times the, uh, the, the uh, land uh, space to spread them out over. But then we go to New York. So New York is at 20 to 20,000 people per square mile. So that's a lot of crowding. This, I know this happened uh, this morning. Um, this actually, a couple of these graphs didn't come across. This is supposed to be a chart that worked just fine yesterday. <laughs> the last few weeks, <laughs> um, this morning comes this way. Um, well, this is really going to, that means all the slides are messed up. Uh, so this chart was actually a comparison between San Francisco and New York. 
the population densities, number one. Number two, um, the African-American uh, population differences, which as we have heard, uh, African-Americans have a much worse um, uh, outcome, I guess, if they're infected. Um, and then of course the, uh, the income. So with the poverty level in Queens, New York area, where all these hospitals were and where I was, uh, is about 19% compared to 10% in San Francisco. So this, the New York, New York City Health and Hospital System is kind of like what we think of as, as county hospitals. So um, I'll show you in a minute, those, all, there's a bunch of them, but they, are, they serve the, on pretty much the under, underprivileged, I guess you call it. Um, so they're county hospitals that cater to the people that you see here. So low income, uh, in the Queens area, there are actually almost 200 languages spoken. Uh, at, at the Elmhurst Hospital where I was, they had 102 interpreters, 102 language interpreters. Um, these are people who can't afford not to go to work. They can't do work from home. It's just not in what they do. Um, they've got a lot of people to feed in their house, and so they have to go to work. They have to go to work to get there by rapid transit, so the subway with you know, sardines uh, and buses. So the virus gets in there, it spreads like wildfire. Um, because these are a large, large number of immigrant families, so a lot of them are living, uh, many families, into one, in one, one household. Um, there's a population density, and there's also the overcrowding of houses, which is defined as more, more than one person per room in the, in the dwelling, excluding bathrooms. Um, in these places, there's two families or three families living in a two or three bedroom apartment. Um, and then as you can see, oh, you can't see. Yes, you can, right there. <laughs> um, that's a picture I took from, uh, from Elmhurst Hospital out the, out, out the uh, front window. Um, and you can see that these are, this, this whole area is covered with these apartment buildings that are very, I mean, you can, this one building here, you can all imagine how many people live in that building. And that's all you see across the whole area. What few houses there are, they're very close together. So there really is no really open area. Um, and this just leads to the, the, the spread of the virus. Um, so when I talked about the New York City hospital system, this is it. So these are all the, the county hospitals, uh, Bellevue being the one we're all familiar with, but you can see um, there's the hospitals we, we know about, the Bellevues, the Elmhurst where I was, uh, the Kings County, Jack, Jacoby, and North Central Bronx. So this is the system that the New York City Health and Hospital System operates under. These are not the private hospitals, not Columbia, uh, this is not New York Presbyterian, these are the, the county hospitals. Just to give you an idea of um, what well, the planning, this is not something that just suddenly you know, showed up in New York when they're totally un unprepared. So back in January, when the virus started kind of becoming, being, we all kind of started hearing about it, their disaster planning teams had already been meeting. Um, they had ordered 650 ventilators at, back in mid-January, but were already told that they're too late, that all those ventilators are being shipped to Asia and Europe. So mid-January, we already didn't have enough ventilators. Tabletop planning is a, is a way of disaster planning that uh, you can do at a tabletop, but you do all the what-ifs. Um, so um, you don't have to have a, a massive uh, drill. You can do your disaster planning with all the people involved and what if this, what if that. And part of those what-ifs what if, are what if 50 patients showed up at a hospital today? What if 100 patients showed up at a hospital today? They actually sent people um, who went to EDs complaining of the symptoms of the coronavirus. And by the way, um, like we hear about COVID and stuff. COVID is coronavirus-induced disease 2019. So it's not, COVID is actually the disease, not the virus. We test for the virus. People have the virus. But they, the asymptomatic patients are not COVID patients because they don't have the disease. It's a term that kind of gets used interchangeably now, but technically COVID is the disease itself. But they sent these people to the EDs um, complaining of symptoms of the coronavirus disease just to see how the EDs would react. They're so-called secret shoppers. They, on the intake forms in the hospitals, uh, they include the questions about travel, which as we all know, once we figured out the first case here, um, that uh, this actually can be a community spread. At that time, it was just, we had to go to China to get it. Um, but that obviously got, oh, that changed very quickly because it no longer became real. And that tabletop planning very quickly became the real thing. So in that New York City uh, hospital system, all those hospitals you saw on that list prior, there is a limited number of ICU beds normally. 
So what they started planning of what if we need more patients, and what if we need more ICU beds than there are patients? And in fact, that really happened uh, very quickly. Um, oxygen supplies uh, diminished rapidly. They were pulling oxygen tanks from anywhere they could possibly find them in the clinics with those little small cylinders to the big cylinders out of the basement. Um, the oxygen supplies to the hospital system uh, couldn't keep up. Patients uh, would show up in the ED at Elmhurst. Um, they had them sitting around one oxygen tank uh, that when they had like eight um, tubing going off to them, they also saw a bunch of chairs around one tank and all sharing that one tank. Um, they were, there were patients in the, the around kind of the, the nursing station. The patients in the beds over here were short of breath from hypoxic, but the patients over there were basically dying um, because they didn't have enough oxygen. PPE, as we all heard, um, became uh, almost was a major problem in the New York system because it just got overrun so quickly. Dr. Galante and, and crew that kept us informed every single day throughout and, and made some rules that not everybody liked, but the, the use of the proper use of P, P, PPE based on science, um, that's why we never ran out of PPE here, besides the fact we didn't have that volume of patients. But in New York, the PPE became a real problem um, because there just wasn't enough of it. Um, enough healthcare workers. Um, there were enough people there, but people became, the healthcare workers became sick. Uh, some of them just became scared to go to work. Uh, and then they can only work so many days in a row. Um, they had to take days off, but there just weren't enough people to go around. Um, then there was discussion early on about Elmhurst. Elmhurst became known as the, um, the epicenter of the epicenter. Um, so the plan was to transfer the, ep the uh, COVID patients to Elmhurst, cohort them by hospital. Uh, that quickly went out of, out of um, favor, I guess, because every hospital is affected at huge volumes and numbers. Um, and then the question, what do you do with the non-COVID patients? How do you separate those two so you're not getting you know, the, the, the two mixed? Um, and that's what we did with the hospital ships off of the Mercy and the Comfort, off of both San Francisco and New York, was the attempt to be able to separate them, sleep train arena, that sort of thing, to get the pe people separated that don't have the disease and don't get infected by those who do. So that was a lot of planning. Here's just an idea of what they went through. Um, March 1st was their very first case. Within a month, they had 1,600 new patients every day. Or, I'm sorry, 1,100 patients every new, a new day, but 350 dying per day. At the peak of Elmhurst's experience, they were losing 40 patients a day. Um, April 2nd, now up to 1,200. Uh, April 3rd, up to 1,200 again. And by April 16th, they had a total of 19,000 people that have been hospitalized in this New York City hospital system, and over 3,000 died. That's Elmhurst Hospital. Uh, it's a 545-bed, um, like I said, kind of a, uh, a county hospital system. The rooms are very much like our East Tower and our East Wing and, and Tower Wing, um, older hospital and uh, and not as pretty as the Pavilion or the Davis Tower. Um, but again, about 200 languages spoken in that general area. This is also the place where you saw in the news where the refrigerator trucks were parked outside the hospital. Um, there were just too many deaths for the uh, coroner and medical examiner system to be able to process. So the bodies were put out in these refrigerated trucks until they could be processed days later. There's one video actually of a, um, he's one of the, I'm not sure, it was like a transporter uh, kind of person, I believe. Um, and he, uh, the, the, the corner, the um, uh, funeral homes came to pick up a body. He recognized the name. It was a guy who was the father of one of his best friends, and he was carrying his body out to the, out of the truck, out to the, the uh, mortuary uh, uh, car. So, um, became very personal. Um, I've been doing this search and rescue for a long time, and one of our, our sayings is rigid flexibility. We create rules so we, when we get there, we can get off and running. But we very quickly realized that the rules that we created, when they become operational, just don't always fit. So uh, we've got to be flexible in the rules that we created. And that's certainly what happened in New York. Um, every possible, every monitor bed became an ICU bed. Uh, and then basically became, at one point, 95% of Elmhurst total beds were COVID patients. Um, every unit that certainly had a, a, a monitor was converted. Um, this A4 uh, was a, a, the A wing, fourth floor, became the biggest COVID unit. had 40 patients in it. That's where I work in, and um, uh, three of our ED uh, uh, attendings and, and residents worked there as well. This was a um, step down unit. 
It was two patients per room, again, looking much like the East Tower. Uh, had a monitor in each room. Normally just step down, not a big deal. Uh, now these patients, these rooms were the full on COVID patients with the ventilators, with the Dallas machines, with all the other equipment in it. Um, it wasn't exactly cool in there. So when you went in with your full, P full PPE, serious PPE, um, and worked there for a few hours uh, before you stepped out, um, it was very uncomfortable. So, um, and again, it was this PPE stuff was serious. The point that when I came back about a day before, two days before I came back, I talked to Dr. Farmer and talked to Christine Williams and said, I want to get tested. <laughs> I was really, really, as much as we adhere to very high level, you know, um, precautions, um, I knew there had been breaks in, in, um, in uh, breaches in, in the uh, ventilators, for instance. Um, so I was actually afraid to have my wife pick me up at the airport, and I was very anxious to come back that next morning, get tested, and be known that I was negative that afternoon. It was a big sigh of relief for me. The pulmonary critical care uh, staff um, were the ones who were leading the charge there initially. There were five of them, of the faculty. One was a fairly old guy, um, so they asked him because of his age, just he was a high risk, so don't come to work. Uh, one of them did get uh, the disease and was out for the duration. Um, one just kind of freaked out. This guy couldn't handle it. Um, and so he quit coming to work. So that faculty of five went to a faculty of two. Uh, they have six fellows each year, uh, or six fellows uh, in their group, so that helps a little bit. But every single person who was available became a leader in these different units all over the hospital. Um, we were on one night, got a, a, a guy came up and uh, asked about uh, how to manage this, this ventilator. Um, and it was pretty complex. And when we asked kind of who he was, it turned out he was leading uh, the, in the women's pavilion uh, uh, recovery area. Um, that he was in charge of that unit. He was a orthopedic intern. So that's who was, you just had everybody. Anybody who had an MD after their name uh, became a leader in some kind of this, in this high level setting. Ophthalmologists were doing uh, the palliative care stuff. EMT guys were working in the ED just to get physical bodies from somebody who kind of knew what they were uh, doing, maybe. And the nurses, I mean, the nurses had been floor nurses uh, yesterday and today. They're, they're, they're high-level ICU nurses. Um, and they're, they're eight to one patients now, or basically one to one or one to two in a very restricted <coughs> area. Um, this is the CDC's uh, biocontainment uh, uh, levels. They have one through four, four being like the Ebola and Marburg viruses, level three being, as you can see up there. But uh, you know, high level in terms of sealed labs, two doors, you have to be highly trained to, to work in that environment. Uh, but as you see, the coronavirus is part of that. So these little posters were all over the hospital, um, the level three being the, the specific COVID units. But after a while, you figure the virus is just all over the place. I mean, it's probably on every one of the floor, every, every elevator button and stuff. So um, you were highly cautious. Um, the whole rigid flexibility thing, uh, the conversion of an x-ray room to a call room. <laughs> um, Got to be flexible. All right, so here's a lot of my graphs start messing up. Um, so what does it do physiologically? All the systems, they, where the ACE2 uh, receptors are present is the organs that tend to get, uh, to get infected or uh, fail. The nose and the lungs are a high volume, heart, kidneys, um, bowel to some degree. Um, so the heart gets, uh, gets affected. Um, once it's in the, in the nose, it's usually not doing a whole lot. So when it starts dropping into the lungs, it then starts setting up the inflammatory, the, the, uh, the uh, cytokine storm. It's kind of an immune dysregulation. That's one of the theories behind why it suddenly just explodes. Um, in the heart, there are receptors. Um, about 20% of people will end up with a myocardial injury. And if so, the, the mortality rate just skyrockets. Um, and 44%, this is one study out of Netherlands, um, with cardiac dysrhythmias. Um, we would have patients who were right now in normal sinus rhythm, and two minutes later, just asystolic. Just start, just like that, uh, for no good reason. Um, sometimes got them back, sometimes not. Part of the, the question, again, is this, this, this ACE2, inhib or ACE2 receptors, one that, that cytokine storm, then also the severe hypoxia we'll talk about in a minute. So are these patients dying of myocardial, or at least being, have myocardial injury due to this severe hypoxemia? They clot. Um, you put in a line. If you don't get the, the IV behind it um, infusing rapidly, you can see the clot form in the catheter as you're putting it in. Um, 
who knows why. I've heard that uh, there's on the on our genome, uh, we've also heard that the uh, blood typing may put you at higher or lower risk, uh, that somewhere on our genome that blood typing is only a few nucleotides away from our, our thromb thrombosis setup. I haven't gotten the detail on that one, but uh, so all the many theories that are why, why what's happening is happening. But these people clot, they clot a lot, um, and they can clot, clot quickly. Question is thromo, uh, prophylaxis. we'll talk about that uh, shortly, but um, PEs are probably the more frequent of the uh, pulmonary death. Most people are not dying of pulmonary death, they're dying as a result of the pulmonary infection and then all the other things that go along with it. Um, and again, the microthrombi. That, again, is it probably, is that what's hurting the kidneys and all the other organs? Who knows? Um, we certainly would think that when people with uh, uh, microvascular disease or small vessel disease like diabetes, you start throwing microthrombi in there in a normal vessel, that would be such a big deal. But those with hypertension, diabetes, though we, though we know we're at higher risk of the disease, uh, may well be uh, kind of exacerbating that th microthrombi on top of their small vessel disease. Um, and again, is this, is, this is a, a, as a potential major source of the outcome. Um, the clot. So D-dimer uh, is a marker for the, the clot burden. Normally it's about 100 or less. Um, just getting these graphs messed up here, but um, I had patients that whose uh, D-dimers were in the 60,000 range. Um, and then you can see the one graph I had actually showed as it going up and then suddenly spiking. Uh, from the very low rate to within a few days going up in that 30, 40,000 range. As you can see on this chart over here, um, it is they go up the survivors versus the non-survivors. So the non-survivors are clearly those who, who clot burden is enormous. Um, and then a couple papers out of China that showed that if you have the clot burden, have a fourfold increase or more of mortality. Um, I, so what do we do about the, the D-dimers? We talked about heparin, probably a, a, a good drug, probably the best drug to use. It's got the anticoagulant as well as the anti-inflammatory effects. The American Society of Hematology has suggested Lovenox, and the, really the reason that they say is because it reduces the number of contacts. So instead of sending a nurse into their patient's bedside every hour or two, whatever, to monitor the, the, uh, the heparin infusion pump, uh, you can inject them once with, or twice a day with Lovenox and, and stay away. So that's, that's the comment behind um, why Lo, uh, the uh, Hematology Society has suggested Lovenox. Um, and, and their suggestion that all the patients should receive Lovenox. One of those single page papers that showed up, maybe two pages that showed up in literature, is uh, the, the thought of using TPA, putting everybody on almost like a prophylactic TPA infusion especially those who uh, D-dimers are going up. Kidney injuries happen in about a quarter of the patients. Um, their mortality goes up markedly. So the patients that end up getting on dialysis, if they're intubated, uh, we would tell families or, and patients that we need to intubate your loved one, but there's about an 80 plus percent chance they'll never come off. Uh, add, uh, add now on dialysis, and the chance of them ever uh, leaving the hospital is about none. Again, is this a direct effect of the virus itself? Um, and we know that the, the, there are uh, virus particles in the kidneys on autopsies, or is it just a uh, secondary effect because of high ventilator uh, use, because of um, uh, volume issues, whatever? Uh, there's a collateral damage. So it's a very predictable course. Um, from a time of symptoms to the time that patients show up in the, in the ER, it's about four days. From the time of, of arriving in the hospital now with enough symptoms to show up in the hospital, the time of intubation is about another four and a half days. So pretty predictable. And I saw yesterday uh, they've now kind of pushed out to 11 and a half days, but that 11, eight to 11 day time frame is a very predictable course in the sick patients. They're gonna be intubated within that eight to 11 day period. Um, they are very hypoxemic. They look okay. Um, they're breathing a little fast. Um, but they got a PO2 in the 50s or less. Uh, so they're very hypoxemic. Again, the whole cytokine storm being the, the question whether that's actually uh, at least in part in uh, the problem. The intubation we talked about is an ARDS-like syndrome. It is not ARDS as we know it. Um, this is, ARDS has been around, has been known, a known entity since the 60s. Has had a bunch of names attached to it, but. Um, the uh, an international consortium, and eventually called the Berlin definition, is what we go by now. 
Um, so a diffuse inflammatory disease, the criteria are acute. It's not like a month ago. Um, a bilateral opacities on whatever imaging you use. The PF ratio, so PaO2 to FiO2 ratio less than 300 on five a peep. So these are intubated patients. Um, and it can't be due to basic fluid, so it's not a cardiac failure or, or hyper, hyper, hyperbulimia. Um, this guy, Gantanini, um, has been kind of at the forefront of, of this whole COVID thing and a lot of the uh, ARDS. He started figuring out that there's actually kind of two phenotypes of, of how patients present. Uh, became initially it was the L phenotype and H phenotype and then became type 1 and 2. The type 1s are either the patients who are early in the disease or maybe just never get beyond that, that early uh, infectious infection course. But those patients have, still have a high lung compliance. Their lungs work de pretty decent in terms of the compliance part of it. The infiltrates on imaging are pretty minimal. Um, the, the lungs are still not full of water, so all those alveoli are still uh, functioning okay. However, there is endothelial damage, um, and there is a VQ mismatch. Normally, when the, when, the, when the environment is hypoxic, there is normal pulmonary vascular vasoconstriction. If you don't want a bunch of blood flow going past uh, you know, not, not aerated stuff. So it should be a, a vasoconstriction. That is lacking in these patients once they have the disease, even in the early phase. Um, this is, uh, and this picture is supposed to show up the next slide. <laughs> Um, boy. Uh, anyway, so this is the next step. This is that 20 to 30 percent that go on to having a much more serious disease. Now the lungs are full of water. They're heavy. Um, the infiltrates are throughout. They're, they're in the same lobes as you see on x-ray. They tend to be the middle and lower lobes. Um, and you see virus particles in those lungs. Um, and this is, the, again, is this a question of the, um, just the, the evolution of the disease itself, or is this because there's lung-induced in, or ventilator-induced injury? Unknown. Um, but now you start treating them like ARDS, uh, the option as far as ventilator management, um, uh, extracorporeal life support is an option, and then prone positioning, which we'll talk about. This is just one study of the man many that uh, early on had 10 patients. Uh, these are what their lungs look like. Um, all, they all had that ground glass stuff in the lungs. Um, none of them had PEs. They all micro, distal microthrombi, but not the central. Um, and like I said, this did... Uh, this, this diffuse damage with uh, virus particles present. So we often in the ICU, or you'll hear me, whatever in the ICU, say that uh, um, we got to trade off what we normally do ventilator-wise uh, for patients who are now kind of on high vent support and accept that the CO2 is high uh, and what it's doing to the pH. So permissive hypercapnia. This became the extreme, and as you can see, uh, P PCO2 of 88. That wasn't, that wasn't at all uncommon. Uh, but the pH is 717, little tiny vent adjustment, sometimes just took a little bit. As long as we got to 70, we're fine. PCO2 is still 80, uh, but as long as that pH was 72 or higher, uh, then we were, we were plenty fine with that. Um, and then, of course, you know, as you get along further, again, we'll talk about proning and, uh, and ECMO. This virus, for whatever reason, uh, causes a really, really tenacious secretions in the lungs. One of the problems is if you put a humidified circuit like we normally do on a ventilator, um, that's not a closed circuit. So now we're humidifying the virus in the lungs and, and aerosolizing them. So these vents were not, uh, did not have a humidified circuit, so they dried the lungs out, so that's a problem. And then the virus itself um, um, is causing this really thick stuff. The, I had a, one patient I was consulted on and for three days, his peak pressures were in the high 40s, mid 50s. Um, I kept telling the team, you need to get that tube out, at least bronch it and see what the, there's your secretions in there. Every day I tell them the same thing because of the same numbers. And finally, they decided they did, um, and this is what the tube was. Uh, it was it was basically caked completely. Uh, part of what drove it is that when we we tried uh, just doing a suction catheter, there we'd get about four or five inches down. And that's as far as we could get. That this, the, the tube was so um, narrowed. Um, and this is just a different example, a different patient. But um, that, actually, the same patient is supposed to be a different slide. <laughs> uh, anyway, so another ET tube with a big plug in, at the end of it. The problem with trying to change these ET tubes out is that this is scary. I mean, these people are at high vent, pre high vent settings, high pressures in their lungs. And now you're going to just pull this tube out and hope you get it back in, and hope you get it back in quickly. Um, and of course, the whole problem with intubating somebody and aerosolizing and you know, all the high pressure and you know, get back to full PPE. 
Um, trying to try to pass a bougie to make it easier, but again, trying to get a bougie past this stuff is almost impossible. So it, it's a, it, I can understand that team's reluctance to, to change that tube out, but once they finally did and took this tube out, the peak pressures went back down to mid-30s. Um, and we're able to back off the ventilator a little bit. So positional therapy, proning. Um, how many times, Jerry, have you proned a patient in your career? Oh, lots. Okay. Yeah. Some have done a lot, some have done almost none. Uh, we do it for ARDS. Uh, but for this disease, is actually pretty good. Now, there are the commercially available beds like this. Um, again, these slides all got mixed up here. Uh, so forget that bed for right now. Uh, this is what I want to talk about over here. So, you know, we get the dependent edema in the lungs. We figure we'll flip them over, and then we got some, that dependent edema goes the other side, and we got some clean lungs. But you think, well, you're just shifting edema around. So how, how are we improving this? It comes down to the actual the shape of the, of, the, of the chest. So it's actually more, not more so much cylindrical as is conical in that you've got the, the posterior lung volume is greater than the anterior lung volume. Uh, and then plus you've got the heart and the mediastinum in the way. So there's actually more lung space posteriorly than there are, in there, I guess, ventrally than there is dorsally than ventrally. Uh, so if you flip them over, now you put that restricted or less lung volume, the, the edema down there and got more perfusion back there. There was a chart that goes along with this that shows the perfusion difference between them. Um, so the problem was that um, the positional therapy or proning never really had a lot of data. There were a bunch of little tiny studies didn't show a mortality benefit until the placebo study was done. Big uh, multi-center trial across a lot of European ICUs. They really um, included the really sick um, ARDS patients. So this, again, this is just ARDS, this is back in 2013. Um, so they made sure that these patients were truly ARDS and just didn't look like it today and they got better tomorrow. That's why they waited the 36 hours. Um, and then they proned them for at least 16 hours at a time. Um, this, again, 400 patients, and they showed a significant both 28-day uh, and 90-day mortality um, um, benefit, um, 16 versus 32 percent, So, uh, as well as just having de a decreased time in the ventilator. So this is the study that actually showed a real science scientifically benefit uh, to proning patients this is the the photo the machine um, you can get this commercially you can't buy it you have to rent it uh, it's fifteen hundred dollars a day per machine per bed um, apparently we we had it in this hospital a bit but it had a lot of complications one uh, skin breakdown and two you just can't get to the patient uh, so i understand we're hot the hospitals looking for a different system uh, but for hospitals that don't have that machine, like Elmhurst, again, Elmhurst is basic county hospital, um, we had to make something up, and that was the proning team. We have a proning team here. It's like the lift team guys. Um, the, the, I looked at the protocol. It's okay. Uh, probably not as, as um, detailed as what we did at, at Elmhurst. Uh, this is our eligibility criteria. It had to be at least 18, not too old, not too, not too young. Uh, had to be on a ventilator for less than 14 days. Um, and 72 hours since their PF ratio dropped below 150. That was the criteria to get in 150, but had to be within uh, 72 hours. We didn't want somebody who's been that sick for many, many days out. PEEP had to be at least five, and their BMI less than 35. The real reason, because this is a manual thing, we're going to flip these patients with just arm strength. So we didn't want a bunch of fat people. The reality was, I think I had one person uh, who was alive um, on a ventilator who was really sick, but uh, who was what you might call marginally obese. I think everybody else had died at that point. Um, we didn't want more than two pressers, although we did do a few patients that had three pressers, pressers on board. We want to stay away from the pregnant patient, putting them on the belly. Um, if, they're, if they're brain dead, of course, we don't want to put, you know, put those people through it. A new pacemaker that could get dislodged, another um, uh, ex uh, exclusion criteria. Um, and then they have, had to have, um, if the, once their PF ratio got more than 200 after few days, whatever it was, then they would be uh, taken off the proning protocol. This was the team. It was a CRNA at the head to manage the airway. I just called them turners. There's four people, two on each side. I won't go into detail how we propped them up. but um, And then somebody kind of leading the team, uh, calling out everything, and then a senior intensivist. It was me, one of my colleagues from Portland, and then um, uh, the pulmonary chief. Um, and the reason, I, I can tell you that, that most times things were okay. Um, but more than once I had patients who we'd prone, uh, they go, they've already been 100% because we put them 100% before we, we uh, turned them, uh, FiO2. 
but their saturations just started plummeting. And I watched them go 90, 70, 60, down to 50s, and hold in the 50s for an extended period of time. The peeps are already high, their alpha altitude is already high, or 100%, slowly go up on the peep, uh, watching for that uh, sudden tension pneumothorax. Um, and then the, my longest patient was 22 minutes trying to get them recovered back to point that I could walk away and say, okay, we're gonna leave this guy prone now for the next 16 hours. Um, so kind of took some experienced uh, decision making. This is a checklist, the pre-prone, the, actually the post-prone stuff. Um, the, the, the details um, are important. I, I'm not gonna go the details at all, but this checklist was important. So every, time, every uh, part of the pre-prone checklist was the, the guy at the head of the bed or the foot of the bed, sorry, calling out each of these uh, bullet points with the expectation was an audible check wasn't like we just skipped over it, because you skip over one or two, and the patients do very badly. So very detailed, very regimented uh, before we ever start moving the patients. Again, this kind of messed up here. But the point, uh, this is a patient I had. Um, I, he came to the hospital right on schedule about four days into his symptoms. Um, he'd been to ER once, and they sent him home. But he came back now four days now with pretty significant hypoxemia. About four days into his hospital course, um, he just could not tolerate CPAP, so he stayed on high flow and on nasal cannula for those four days. But now became uh, beyond what that, could, what that would do for him was intubated. His PF ratios uh, were terrible, as you see this gas here. You see a significant amount of vent support. PF of 12, FIO2 of 80%, and he has a PO2 of 60. So a PF ratio of 75, which is really, really low. Um, when we prone them, we would um, support them on their, their pelvis and chest and basically leave the belly free so it could have an excursion. Um, he was a, just a normal shaped guy. But his first gas, we always got a gas within an hour, and as you can see, kind of, his CO2 is 100. His pH is uh, 718. We went back, did a little, just minor adjustments, just enough to free his abdomen up a little bit, and then we got to, <laughs> those little boxes. Anyway, it got to acceptable pH at 731, and CO2 was still 70. So little minor things uh, made major differences. Um, this graph got messed up. Um, so this is just some uh, um, proning and supine uh, recordings of some a couple patients. You can see the numbers are all over the place over there. So the proning didn't do anything. This one on this side, you can kind of make up a line that's slightly getting better over time uh, with the proning. And so that guy, we continued until he, uh, this guy actually went on to die. Um, the numbers below were what we did with the, um, the samples or with the patients we had. So these were, we always got a gas uh, one, hour, one hour before we prone them, one hour into it, and then one hour before we, we slept them back over. So 16 hours prone, eight hours supine. So as you can see here, the PO2 pre-prone went from 108 to the 140, 150 range with a significant, um, um, statistically significant value increase. And even when they went back uh, supine again an hour afterwards, they still retained um, uh, improvement. CO2 went up as expected, but after they were put back in the supine position, there really was no significant difference. So we got improvement with the oxygenation. The CO2 changed a little bit, but went back to normal. Um, okay. Well, that's supposed to be one of the last graphs for <laughs> or charts. Anyway, so the recommendations. Um, the CDC put out their newest recommendations uh, June 25th, so a week and a half ago. Um, most of them haven't changed. Uh, these are some when I put a couple extra ones in yesterday. Um, do not give oxygen for people whose saturations are more than 90. Some people say 92%, but you don't need oxygen if they're, uh, they're in that 92% range. Um, and you don't need to get them to 100%. Just give enough oxygen to keep them well oxygenated, which is plenty fine in that 92 to 96% range. If they start needing more problem or more support, high flow nasal cannula should be your first um, uh, first option. If that starts to fail or you can't go any further with, with that, then you get into the BiPAP, CPAP, the non-invasive ventilation stuff. And if need be, now you intubate them in a controlled setting with an experienced person. This is not an anesthesia intern intubation. Um, this is somebody who knows what they're doing and get a first pass uh, success. Then we use the lung protective mechanism, our uh, protocols of the low tidal volumes. We try to keep the plateau pressures less than 30. I can tell you that when you have, when you're at 100% FiO2 and you got a peep of 15 and the peak pressures are in the 30s or 40s, not much else you can do. Maybe you can tweak the volume a little bit, but um, you're already pretty much maxed out. So it was not uncommon to have people in the, in the mid 30s of their peak pressures. Um, 
Now, if you have the moderate, kind of the moderate to se severe high, uh, ARDS, if you have peak pressures in the 30s and you're at peak of five, that's a lot of swing pressure difference per breath. So it's, that increases a lot of shear forces on the alveoli. So it's actually okay. It's actually better to have higher peeps and decrease that that swing between uh, pressures on each breath. On each uh, breath. Um, so higher peeps are, are okay. Higher peeps being up to about 15, 16. Um, the judicious fluid management. So uh, this is like the burn patients. This is this is science. You cannot just say, well, put them at 150 cc's an hour, oh, 75 cc's an hour. You measure urine output frequently, and you adjust your urine output or your uh, fluid input accordingly. Um, the positional therapy for those who, once they get to that low PF ratio, um, and I'd say 16 hours a day would be the best. 16 hours on prones, eight hours, eight hours supine. And you go until their PF ratio is improved, which I say could be days or weeks later. Neuromuscular blockade, um, you know, we had a lot of data from the, the 90s and even early 2000s of people who had that post paralytic syndromes for people that were on continuous neuroblockade for, uh, uh, for you know, days or weeks. Um, so we're a little more judicious now, but certainly in these patients, it should be used when you need it. If the chest wall compliance is, is keeping it from getting uh, ventilated properly, then intermittent neural uh, blockade is okay. Um, BV ECMO, uh, it's, there, it's not indicated for any like uh, routine use, but for the selective patients, I hate to say the word rescue because I think that's why ECMO fails, um, because we use it as a rescue mode. At that point, the patients are too far gone. Um, but keep it in your regimen, and those patients who are looking like they're not going to do well on high-level vent support or proning, the first thing, uh, then you can consider VV ECMO. We never had, up until about a month ago at least, um, as far as I know, we had two patients who were consulted with the ECMO team, um, the, um, but uh, never got put on. Because they were got, they had some car, they developed some cardiac dysrhythmias, and the fear was that they were heading toward something bad, but they never got put on here. Um, these lungs are very stiff, and they got high level of vent support, so be very very cautious and look for pneumothoraces. And of course, those that will vent can proceed pretty quickly to tension pneumothoraces. So as you're adjusting your ventilator, or even just in between, if you see a sudden a, a, big, a sudden change, look for the, look for the pneumothoraces. Um, Aggressive ET suctioning, as I showed you, I think probably um, it should actually be some almost like a scheduled uh, bronchoscopy. Uh, once that sec secretion start forming in those tubes, it's really hard to get them out because they're so thick. So keep them clean on a regular basis. You might be able to decrease the amount of uh, reintubations, um, and that, but if they are they are occluded. Change them accordingly. Um, Basal or uh, norepinephrine is a basal pressure choice uh, for those who are hemodynamically unsafe stable. Lovenox for those, for just everybody basically for, for prophylaxis. Um, antibiotics, again, like kind of like burn patients, you don't give them routinely, you give them specifically. So these patients are very prone to super infections, uh, but use antibiotics for those infections, not just with prophylaxis. Steps of surveillance, again, they're, they're very uh, prone to infections, so watch them like a hawk. You gotta do all, all the lines, look at those lines. Groin lines are easy to put in because the vessels are big, they all get contaminated within a week. So you need, preferably you've got the lines up in here. Now you're concerned because of big stiff lungs with high pressures and you're gonna poke a lung and on and on. Uh, but um, watch those lines very carefully uh, as well as your BALs and the urine. Enteric feeds, um, we know that we kind of got away from, uh, we got away from nasal intubation a long time ago because it blocks the station tubes and out of the, um, um, and the sinuses and you get sinusitis and you get an infection that way. So we've gone more all oral intubation, uh, but we also probably should consider keeping our, or our, our um, feeding tubes oral as well. Keep stuff out of the nose. Even though the diapos are small, um, they can cause irritation. You can get sinusitis out of it. You don't need another super infection. Um, the things that didn't show up in here that um, I put in last night, um, low-dose dexamethasone now is uh, considered for those who are in need of oxygen or on the ventilator, should not be used for those who are, who are not at uh, that point yet. Uh, and then remdesivir is the only uh, um, antiviral, antibacterial that's actually indicated again for those people who are now at the point of needing oxygen supplementation. Um, the hydro, uh, the chloroquines and all, uh, were actually in use for this disease uh, from the FDA under uh, compassion use. 
Uh, that was rescinded about three or four weeks ago when the FDA said this doesn't help at all. So Dr. Trump was wrong. Um, there we go. That's actually what it's supposed to look like. Um, so the masking does work. Uh, we, we need to hopefully avoid all these really sick patients by, by preventing initially. Um, this works, social distancing works, um, and what we want to do is, this is about uh, three blocks off of Times Square, about 6.30 on a weekday morning, uh, north, south, east, west. And I walked across the side of a crosswalk and I thought, wow, took my phone out, take a picture. <laughs> Didn't worry about getting hit by a car because there were no cars. Um, this is New York City uh, and kind of the, the, the peak of the thing. And then we want to get back to what we used to do. Um, so got to be patient and do the right thing now and we'll get there. Dr. Schatz, thank you both for your service and your uh, willingness to put yourself at considerable risk to help bring this experience back to us. I think, you know, we talked a lot before you left about personal safety and I also, I think that your experience is a great example of that with utilizing the proper attention to personal safety, you can be in the mix of the worst area and still come out uninfected. And I think that's just a great lesson for all of us. I, I told the interns when they first came, and I want to reiterate it for everybody, that your personal safety is our number one concern. You can't help others if you're not helping yourself. And so just reminding everyone, and I think you are role modeling that example for us through your experience there, that you can do it safely. Take the time to protect yourself. I think that's just, I can't say that strongly enough to everybody. Um, I can say that when I, before I went to New York, I was certainly concerned. When I came back from New York, I was scared. So, uh, and there were people on the streets in, in Queens, as I could actually see my time there, that the streets were getting a little more populated. And I was in front of the hospital and I thought, you know, if you people just saw what was behind those walls, you wouldn't be in the streets. Let's give you a chance. Yeah, thanks for that talk. That was fantastic. Um, I want to also point out to all the residents what a pro Dr. Schatz is. He had some slides that messed up and he just kept going. No big deal. Um, I wanted to ask if... Uh, that's rigid flexibility. That's go. right. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask, uh, you presented some information about therapy, uh, sorry, prophylactic lovinox, and given the the rate of uh, thromboembolic events, I was wondering if anyone has looked at uh, bumping that up to therapeutic lovinox. If people are considering prophylactic TPA, it seems yeah. like maybe therapeutic lovinox because of the issue with uh, the timing of the doses might might be reasonable to consider. Yeah, you know, once the, the D dimers, which is a good one to follow, once they start climbing, that's when you should switch over to the therapeutic. I have a question online. Um, Dr. Galante was asking about lovinox. How much of that lovinox is actually absorbed in those patients? <laughs> And um, along the same lines, Dr. Humphreys is asking, is there a role for using higher doses of Lovinox for prophylaxis when these patients are admitted prior to them developing thrombi? You know, we, we, we don't give um, sub-Q kind of injections in the ICU in general because we're concerned about their absorption. And these patients, a lot of them are, are edematous. Certainly in the days where you use tons of crystalloid. Um, these patients tend not to be edematous. Uh, so, um, so that will kind of take that factor out in terms of increasing the dosing. Um, I don't know if there's any benefit to upping the dosing based on the, the um, thrombosis or the clot burden. Um, so the recommendations are basically what we do as a routine prophylaxis or uh, therapeutic dosing. Dave, nice talk. Uh, do you know what the latest is on uh, um, you know the potential protectiveness of antibodies? And, um, and maybe a question for Dr. Farmer after you're done. Uh, what, what's the latest on uh, possible employee testing? We had heard about that a few weeks ago, but not much since. So the, uh, our testing is all flawed uh, in that I can be negative today, get exposed to a patient tonight, and be positive tomorrow. So just because I was negative you know, in the past really means nothing. Uh, the only way you can actually do this is test everybody every single day, and that's obviously never going to happen. Um, that's just for the, the virus testing and the, you can get your nose swabbed. Um, 
the antibodies are a kind of a twofold. Can a person who's been infected once get it reinfected? And do uh, will our vaccines be of any value? So the question there's a fewfold. One, we don't know what the protective levels of antibody are. We measure the nanograms of protein, uh, antibody protein, um, and that's how we determine whether the vaccine um, vaccine is effective. We don't even know what that minimum nanogram protein level is for this virus. And then we got the antibody persistence. And, you know, you get your tetanus shot every 10 years because we know that, the, that those antibodies persist about, about probably more 12 years, but we would get everybody 10 years. We don't have, we have no idea what the antibody persistence is in this disease. Is it a come and go quickly? We still have the IgM and IgG formation with us, but how precision are the antibodies, we have no idea. Um, so the antibody testing is, a, it's, it's, I think it's important. Um, the, the, we need nothing else to gain our knowledge. The other part is the um, a convalescent serum, the convalescent plasma. It does seem to work, the convalescent plasma being those plasma taken from those who have been infected and theoretically taking their antibodies and giving it to somebody else. Um, seems to be effective. Again, on the short term, long term, nobody knows. So the institution had originally planned, uh, had talked about doing uh, uh, serology testing uh, for all the employees. I think as the science evolved with that, they realized they didn't know what to do with that information and if it would be valuable. So that plan is on hold. The, there is a study that is going on that's being led by one of our public health uh, leaders here that uh, is looking at that. So once we get, and so there was some random testing being done related to that study. And I think once we get information from that, that might inform it in a better fashion. I think the other thing that everyone needs to know is that there is now a shortage of the, um, just the viral testing and the viral test kits in the Sacramento region, actually throughout the state of California. We as an institution have been very um, proactive about uh, offering testing to the community. We are pulling back on that, sadly, right now and focusing uh, on the patients in the hospital and the perioperative patients and things like that. So it is a, uh, it is a daily moving target for us as, as this ramps up here. So just to answer that question. And we have, we are resuming the um, command center activities. We had closed that down a, a couple of weeks ago. That activity is being resumed and we are increasing the sort of communication around COVID and COVID response, which again, we had essentially uh, put on hold when that curve flattened out quite a bit. So remember also that it takes nine days to get you to get detectable antibody from any antigen, whether it's a vaccine or just an exposure. So again, you may have been exposed to a patient three days ago uh, and you'll be negative on the antibody test, but you've got it. Uh, given just like the increased mortality with intubation, are there any protective maneuvers um, uh, such as positive pressure ventilation or like a non-invasive or like proning before intubation yep. that are protective? Yep. So, yes. That, that should be kind of, the proning is a good question. Um, certainly what I showed before with the uh, high flow, high flow then to stepwise to the non-invasive, the BiPAP, CPAP, and of course those are now aerosolizing, uh, so we gotta be, you know, more uh, isolated. Um, and then on to uh, intubation. But there is a self-proning uh, that works. So the patients who are not yet intubated can lie on their stomach or on their side. And I had a cold patients who I'd see doing exactly that, sitting up on the, outside the bed for hours and hours and hours, and then even lying down, but up on their elbows. So they weren't quite face down, but they were kind of self-proning. So it does work. We'll go Dr. Dirkwich and then Manny. Uh, let's see, two points. One, a word of caution for all of us. Um, uh, you can't be you can't be cavalier about patients that come into the hospital um, because the COVID testing, even on patients that are admitted, admitted, can take a day or even longer to come back. And so, when you're treating someone, uh, assume they're COVID positive. Wear your gloves when you're examining them. Make sure the patient has a mask. Uh, make sure all the equipment and the and the uh, the gear in the room uh, is uh, disposable and you can move it. Um, just we, my service knows we had one guy yesterday got admitted, transferred here. There was a lot of ugly dressing change and exposure material, and lo and behold, the next day his COVID test came back positive.
without any understanding of it during the time we're taking care of them. So you, you just you just got to assume that everyone has it. Uh, Dave, a little comment about the question for you. What is the status of, you mentioned it very briefly, but the use of steroids and the timing of it in people with the lung disease. So it's got kind of come and gone and using a, uh, different levels of, and different kinds, but dexamethasone is now the recommendation uh, and only once you start having oxygen requirement, oxygen, supplemental oxygen requirements. How much? 10 milligrams, I think, was the, the dose. Um, I think it was a dose, if I recall. Uh, one for Dr. Schatz and then Dr. Farmer. Dr. Ian Brown asks, is there any role for uh, mucolytic like N-acetylcysteine or does the inhalation delivery cause too much risk for aerosolization? And then Dr. Humphreys asked, uh, Dr. Farmer, if you can address the policy that came out yesterday about everyone wearing eye protection. Um, it's a good point about the mucolytics um, or, um, you know, to keep the thin the secretions. Um, in general, though, that usually means breaking the circuit. Uh, so you do have aerosolization. Um, one thing I'd, I'll say that in, um, in New York, there were respiratory, ther respiratory therapists, but they were few and far between. So every one of those vent changes, every one of those um, ventilator adjustments all done by the R1, the ENT guy, whatever. Um, but uh, in a system where you're not overloaded like that, uh, you could get RT and then get in an isolated area. You could potentially do that. And I think it's a good idea um, to, to, to try to thin those secretions down. I, uh, just before I answer the question, I just want to commend Manny on his uh, complete uh, mastery of medical terminology. The guy's <laughs> like rocking it just completely. I think guessing. we're going to give you an honorary degree by the end of the year. <laughs> so, so thank you for taking on this job. Oh, it's like having to be cool when your slides don't work, so thank you. Um, so the, there are new policies and new recommendations coming out on a regular basis. It meant the masking policy, I unfortunately, I thought was a little bit complicated the way it was written, but the essence is there is now mandatory masking uh, for in all environments on campus. Um, the uh, advanced PPE is specific for aerosolizing procedures and the recommendations from the operating room uh, are the same as they have been. And those, uh, if there's anybody who has questions, please let us know. We'll make sure that we communicate those again. The eye protection was also uh, recommended, uh, made in all, required in all patient environments. And I will double check and send that around again. I do remember admonishing, and I'm going to like carefully look at someone who has glasses on so that I'm not, you know, bashing anyone individually, but I remember making the comment a while ago that you all should just be wearing eye protection in general these days. Um, and, you know, you can get your fake stylish glasses, but in fact, the, uh, the recommendation is eye protection for certainly all patient uh, interactions now as well. And, uh, you know, we have people, you know, Always think of that after they've been splattered with blood in the operating room, imagine the stuff you can't see. And I really strongly encourage everybody just to wear eye protection everywhere. The other advantage of that is that if you, you it, it makes it harder for you to touch your eyes and things like that. So people on planes and restaurants and you know, all these things, um, eye protection I think should be part of this as well. And I think there have been cases of people who have probably transmitted it to themselves have been more recently reported through contact with uh, uh, eyes as well. So now I'm going to look at the people that don't have glasses on and <laughs> say, get your eye protection. <laughs> Go ahead. With everyone on Lobanox, did you see a lot of hemorrhagic complications? And then with all of your procedures, did you also notice a difference? Um, with the procedures, no. Um, I did have one patient who uh, developed a GI bleed. Uh, he was way into the disease, and uh, we couldn't stop it. He died a day later because, uh, you know, like a GI bleed, we couldn't stop it. I was lucky in that I only, I think two days went by that I didn't lose somebody, um, but it was uh, at least a death a day for me, but that was certainly better than the 40 a day that uh, they were seeing early on in the course. You know, we will continue uh, in our department to see lots of patients who have equally serious diseases, if you will. Um, obviously, the trauma volume that was presented this morning, uh, thank you very much for the uh, overview of how much has gone how much has gone, how much the uh, trauma 
incidence has gone up in our community. We're going to continue to see those patients. As Dr. Jerkovich mentioned, we're not going to know if those patients also may be COVID positive, but it's going to be a busy time for us. There's just no question about it. And we need everybody to stay healthy and support each other and ask questions if you don't know. This isn't, this isn't you know, a time to be proud about anything. This is uh, all being in it together and learning and, uh, and helping each other take care of these patients. And let's just hope it doesn't get too much, too more, much more difficult. But if it does, we'll be uh, ready to take care of it. But protect yourself first. Dr. Schatz, thank you again. Thank you.